So today I'm continuing my conversation with Tim from Rowan. And today I have Lisa Richardson and David McLeod. Uh, welcome hi. back, David. And hi, Lisa. Very nice to see you guys. <laughs> and we'll talk about uh, what Rowan does, with design, how the magazine is being published, basically from like conception of the idea of the magazine, the next magazine, to how you pick the projects for it, how you pick the designs, how you choose who is going to be participating in it, what yarn is going to be showcased, and so forth, so on. But since, David, since I already had you on my channel, and if you guys missed that, that's chapter one of my Rowan coverage. <laughs> you can go there and watch it and get to know David better. I want to start with Lisa. Tell okay. me a little bit about your fiber story. Like David learned to read before he started walking, basically. What is your story? <laughs> um, Not with, quite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, I think... Um, with knitting and things i've got quite a crafty family so um well crafty and like um diy do it yourself so our mum's really into kind of she'll do anything you know like plaster it and all that kind of stuff so we're very kind of hands-on type people um but it was my gran and my aunt who taught me how to knit and crochet so my gran taught me how to knit and my aunt taught me how to crochet and it was um from being really young i can remember um used to do ballet and everybody had like these little crochet like bun covers for their hair um, and I wanted one of those and it was my aunt that taught me how to crochet to make one of those for my hair when I was like really small and knitting wise it was um, my gran just you know I think it was like a scarf or something um, but at school um, when I was at school like so many years ago we did knit at school as well and sewing and things like that so I can remember knitting like a little Father Christmas and and stuff and just kept it going kind of dipped in and out of it through kind of um my childhood and then when I studied art I brought in um some kind of crafty elements as well and I did wall hangings with knit and crochet elements to those so always kind of done bits but more in the art sense than um clothing when I was younger let yeah. me ask this question both of you when I was growing up, like my grandmother was knitting and sewing and crocheting and all of those things, but it was out of necessity. It was something uh, to cover the need, right? So some a child needs a new jumper or a child needs a new dress, like she would make it. Yeah. For you now and for you growing up, like did that change for you? Was that something also out of necessity and now it's because of the joy of the art or was it always for you like a hobby a craft sort of thing um well I think with my um my mum and um like the rest of my family it was probably a bit of both um so my mum enjoyed doing it you know like she enjoyed kind of the making side of it more sewing than knitting um but it was to make things that she couldn't find in the shops or things that like maybe I'd like but couldn't afford so you know uh, like I can remember in the 80s wanting like a back ring jumper like you know with the big kind of sleeves and so my mum um knitted me one because that's you know like they were just too expensive so um it was a bit of both for her I think and then for me it's always been um creating something that you love so it's the the creating side of it and actually having something that you've kind of that's got like there's a longevity to it once you've made something you want to keep it for a long time so it's a, a not necessarily now that you can't go out and buy it but more that you want to kind of make something that you love yourself how about you david uh yeah it, the same really i mean definitely is when i was a kid and it was necessity we had school jumpers knitted and things for us and it you know four kids at home not everybody could afford to, to go out and buy those stuff and but def and then later in life, like because my whole family knit now, basically it's it is very much a um, an enjoyment, a relaxed thing. Um, new babies on the scene tend to make everybody pick up the needles, and I have a great niece and two further great nieces or nephews on the way, so needles are picked up at the moment. So yeah, it's kind of it's I don't I can't remember exactly when it did switch, but I'm very similar to Lisa. It was very much necessity and did change at some point but I don't know when it did <laughs> well another thing that you two have in common is that you both grew up inside of Rowan basically 
And we talked more details during my interview with David, like we discussed that. But Lisa, tell me how you found yourself at Warren. Um, well, I started over 20 years ago. I think it was my anniversary in July. Um, and I started as an office temp. So my um, initial contract was for six weeks, I think, to come in and kind of help out with filing and things like that. Um, and then once I'd been there a little while, they kind of extended that and then eventually just kind of um, took me on into the, the little hub of Rowan at the time in the old mill. Um, but yeah, 20 years ago, so quite a, quite a while ago and not doing knitting at the time. So what I was doing before coming into Rowan, um, I'd done tailoring. So um, I did quite a lot of kind of like fabric work. So, and Rowan was into fabrics as well at that time. So some of the first things I designed was fabric rather than knit. But you're also doing, now you're doing crochet and knitting designs as well. When did that start? When did you get your first gig as a knitting or crochet designer at all? Uh, that was in, I can't remember whether it was magazine 37 or 38, um, but definitely in 38 had um, crochet and knit in there that I'd designed. Previous to that, I think it was just fabric designs because we, we always used to have like a little editorial that would have um, normally homewares pieces that was, was sewn with the Rowan fabrics. But the magazine 38 was the first one that had quite a few pieces in. One of the things that comes up in my conversation with Rowan designers is that because of the nature of Rowan magazine, it takes about 18 months to publish. And you guys just came up with Rowan 74. Yeah. Been studying it for the past two days. Uh, <laughs> and Lisa, your designs are there. And actually, a lot of people that I interviewed, their designs are there as well. So it was interesting for me to see it because we talked during the interviews about them, but to see it like actually on paper, it's a different feeling. Yeah. Do you remember your designs? But by the time the magazine comes out, do you remember what you submitted to that magazine? <laughs> um, well, I'm lucky because I'm in the office as well. Um, so I get to see when things come back from the knitters. So I see the whole process kind of by being in the design room. Um, so I'm kind of keeping up to date with how the process is going. And then I also did the um, photo shoot for that one as well. So I kind of was involved in that bit. So it's it wasn't just like uh, with some designers who submit the design and then don't see it again until it's in print. I luckily get to kind of see it at various points along the way and get to see the garment and get to see the photography and everything else. So luckily, I kind of remember some of what's in the magazine by the time it comes out. David, when I talked to you last time, you couldn't tell me the secret about something that was coming out in this magazine 74, because it was a few days before that. But there is a new kid on the block in the Rowan <laughs> collection. There is fine tweed haze. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about like how that originated and what was the process of developing that yarn? Well, that one's quite interesting in a couple of ways because we obviously brought out tweed haze um, a couple of seasons ago and we're doing fine tweed haze this time and that is something that both me and Lisa have been kind of around for a bit because the idea of tweed haze and fine tweed haze is to take our much loved uh, felted tweed ply it up with uh, kid silk haze and that was the effect and that was the idea of this yarn to make a tweed effect with that kid silk haze effect haze on it as well. So we did the tweed haze, which was slightly heavier, and we've gone finer this time. And that's basically what the idea came from, taking those two yarns and merging them together. But also that, so when it says 18 months to bring out a magazine, me and Lisa and the team have been working with that yarn for, it's over 18 months now, because yeah, it's taken yeah. that long to play with it. And and um, Lisa's really involved in like the early knitting stages and getting the tension set and kind of making sure it behaves and that everybody likes it and it kind of works that um, as a yarn, as a commercial thing as well. When you decide on the magazine uh, story, right, like what yarns you're going to be covered, how does that go? Like, let's talk about the process of conception of the magazine. Who... Whose idea is that? Like, <laughs> tell me a little bit about the roles of the team members. Who decides on what? It is it's a definite team effort. So um, it can work in various ways. So we can either have um, like ideas that kind of come down to um, the designers 
of you know like we need we want kind of this in the main magazine or we want this as a brochure and then we come up with design briefs for that or we work it the other way sometimes where designers will just come with kind of um ideas for a design brief and say this is what I kind of like perceive the garments kind of look like and the theme and I would like to use this yarn with it so it can work in two different ways really and then for a season what we try and do is manage the whole thing of the brochures and the magazine and all the different yarns that Rowan uses to be able to make sure that we kind of show newness with all of those different yarns as well um, so yeah, definitely, um, obviously to, to David and Sharon kind of managing all that as well to make sure that it all sits together nicely. We get lots of ideas in a season and it's not actually about, it's never about not having enough. It's actually deciding which ones we go forward with. It's, it's a really creative team and everybody all is feeding ideas all the time. So, Well, one of the things that I really sort of getting impressed as I go and interview Rowan members and it sort of grows on me is the fact that you have designers in your company who's been working there for decades, like Martin Story, like Kay Fawcett. And then you have like newer designers, younger designers, brand new designers like M. Hall or um, Georgia Fawcett, which we talked about it, that how long, how many designs do you have to have under your belt to be stopped called <laughs> young new designer? But when you work with somebody who has been there for 40 years, like it's sort of inevitable. And I like the fact that when you open Raw magazine, like one of the person who I talked to said, oh, I like four designs there. But that's great because that one person found four designs that she likes for herself, right? And then you have somebody who is completely different taste and completely different uh, age category. And they'll find four designs that they like for themselves. So this diversity of designs is something I came to appreciate about Rowan. Is that by design? <laughs> I think, well, um, it's the fact that, you know, like the, the designers that have been there for 40 years, are still you know like they're obviously designing amazing things so they we you know like we want them to stay within the kind of Rowan family and then quite often when new people start with Rowan in especially in the design room they have an interest in what we do to start off with they might have a design background or they've studied um, knit design or textiles so when they come in and they see all the creativity around them then that helps kind of like boost their creativity and like you know David and everybody wants to kind of harness that and kind of you know help them to to grow in their design as well so it, and it's really nice to see kind of especially being in the design room seeing because Anna Hall's in the design room so is, um, Chloe Thurlow and when the designs come in it's their designs just like how lovely it is that you know that's happened when you you're not necessarily working as a designer in your actual career but you you're still being able to kind of do that as well okay I have a question about it do you have to work at Rowan to become one of those selected designers? Or can you be just a kid from the street with some brilliant design idea and you will still invite him as a designer for a particular brochure or ma magazine? Yeah, good question. Um, it's all of that. You can be from anywhere. Um, really, we do like to encourage creativity within the team and within, as Lisa says, and actually it's very good because it when it's in the team the creativity exists within there and they really know the workings and the understandings of Rowan but actually all of us Lisa included Sharon myself external team we do watch other designers around the world we pull them in we talk to them we have like a list of um designers that we will send briefs out to um, they are that is very selective and it's very curated by us because we don't send out a mass brief it's actually very much managed because um we have people that we add purposefully because they're adding something into the design pool or people that are adding a particular colorway or doing something exciting yeah so they can come from anywhere but it is it is managed is what i would say we, we have like um a certain way of working as well where when a designer is doing a design they are just submitting kind of their swatch and their sketch and they may send a spec sheet for it like the specification for the size of it but they're not knitting that garment they're not writing the pattern for it 
And for some designers, that's quite um, a difficult kind of break from their design process. Mm. Um, so that is kind of part of our selection of who kind of does the designs with us as well, that they kind of work in that format so that when we then um, write all the patterns, they're kind of consistently written, all the knitting's consistently knitted by our knitters so that it's all detention and everything else. So we can kind of produce the, the right garments and the right patterns at the end we have to kind of just follow the process that we do. Some people, if it's accessories and stuff, they'll knit them, won't they, David? But mm -hmm. generally, it's, yeah, we do it all in-house. Right. It also allows us to control the sizing, the tension, the working up and down of that pattern. Lisa gets very involved in that technical step yeah. with Anna and kind of just making sure that it all works technically as a pattern. Let's talk about the 74. My question to you, so this specific magazine was showcasing two yarns. It was the felted tweed and it was the fine tweed haze. Mm -hmm. And so I'm guessing that you gave this uh, yarn to your designers and you said, show us what you can do with that. And that's how this magazine was created. Am I right? Am I wrong? <laughs> there was two different design briefs. So the um, felted tweed, my way was briefed by Georgia Farrell worked out that brief. So then that will get sent out to all of the designers that we kind of we would like to kind of um, select from. Um, and it won't just be kind of use felted tweed. There'll be imagery there. Generally, it's kind of um, kind of nice shots and like landscapes or different colours that we want them to use and things like that, just to kind of start the inspiration process. So then all designers are working from the same inspiration. So then hopefully you'll have a story that works kind of cohesively together, even though it's from all different kind of designers of, you know, different backgrounds and different ages. Who creates those mood boards? In that instance, it was Georgia Farrell's brief. So she created the mood board. But all of our designers, so all of our core designers, I'd call them, so like Lisa, Georgia, Martin, Chloe, they will all create mood boards because that is a way that we understand what their vision is for that brief or what that vision is for that collection. It's a way of just getting the ideas out and um, also explaining that in a design brief that goes out to other designers. Well, you mentioned during our last interview that you have... Uh, trend predictors that mm -hmm. rely heavily on for colors and for fashion uh, trends. How much those trends influence the mood boards and the this call for designs for the mm. magazine? Um, they do a bit. Um, we don't hold a massive amount of weight by prediction mm -hmm. services because a lot of our designers kind of do their own research or into design and kind of what's coming through and watch it alone. And um, we do, uh, like Trisha Malcolm kind of watches all our, the catwalk shows and pulls out all the knitwear. So she gives us a kind of a an overview of the knitwear fashions coming through on the catwalks. And then obviously like Lisa Martin, they take that, ingest that, digest it down and come out with, you know, like it's, there's frills appearing, there's a lot of check appearing, and we'd edit that down. And then usually on a design brief, sorry, putting words in Lisa's mouth. So Lisa will come with a design brief, for example, and say, I've done it like this um, because I have picked, picked up on that trend coming through. And I think that's really useful. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. So there is a bit of uh, weight in the trend prediction services, but also we have to take our own brand spin on it too. Yeah, it, it really does depend on the story as well. So like um, for certain stories, you might kind of notice that there's loads of um, fishermen's like jumpers, you know, with all the cables and everything else. So we might then take out some imagery from, you know, like historical kind of references for those kind of jumpers and then do like a nice mood board with themes of like a really stormy sea and things like that just to get kind of the designer's kind of inspiration going. So it's not necessarily here's like an image of you know catwalk um, cable jumper. We kind of then think about stripping it back and going back to like the historical references, and then kind of sending those out with a little bit of more kind of emotional mm -hmm. imagery as well. And then the other thing we have to do in a collection, which is something that you mentioned earlier, we have to take into account what is in that collection. So like 
you know, cardigans, longer length cardigans, sweaters, V-necks, everything. We really think about what's in the collection as a broad thing. We think about a broad spectrum to cover your body shape, um, to cover technique, to cover ability of knit, to cover cost to knit. That's all considered in what goes in a collection. And also, if there's a particular trend or something like that we think is going to be key, we make sure that that is hit in there as well. So it's there's a lot goes a lot of thinking goes into how much what we cover and the yarns we use. Yeah. Well, one of the things I talked about with Martin was the new trend of seamless knitting, and you actually covering it's this story of. Uh, issue 74 you talk about mm -hmm. seamless knitting the top down sweaters top down and around there's like whole uh, article about like what it means why it's so popular and so on and martin was saying how because he has been working with Ron for a while like he grew up on seaming the sweaters he grew up on piecing the all these things and for him it's like a new learning curve when you do that design brief, do you tell the designers what construction they must use because you're covering it in the story? There's been um, certain stories that we've done which have been specifically um, what we'd call kind of like a seamless or less seamed story. So it's not always top down in the round, but um, interesting kind of like construction techniques included in that and then we would tell the designers that that's what we're aiming for and um, so they can design to that otherwise if it's just like the story where it was the felty tweed my way then that was just left open to the designers to kind of choose how they wanted to have it constructed well david you know i like to ask difficult questions every once in a while <laughs> I have one for today okay I, I sort of brought it up with martin as well Martin mentioned in one of his interviews that he does like, or he used to do uh, up north of 100 uh, designs per year. Mm -hmm. And because you have so many publications, so many brochures and so many magazines published, the designers work really full time, and especially because they're not needing the samples, they just come up with the concept and they come up with the swatches, they produce many more designs. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the fact that you give them this design brief, you tell them what yarn you want them to work with, you tell them what construction you want them to create, do you think it pushes them outside of their comfort zone or do you think it dilutes their creativity and they would come up with something masterful otherwise without <laughs> the guidance? Well, it... <laughs> I know, I feel like I say this every time to you, Irina. It's a bit of both, if I'm perfectly honest, because I do actually think asking designers to do something that's not out with their norm does actually produce phenomenal results. We've had some fantastic stuff and actually designers have kind of not realised that that's their thing. And just by being asked, they go off in a whole loop and it works totally. Um, but then on the flip side, we have designers that can come to us and go, that's not really working for me. And they kind of, this is what I was thinking to do. And we're totally open to that as well. It's not one or the other. Um, and, you know, there are certain designers that are kind of, will always ha are happy and are comfortable in doing what they do. But it's, there's also like Georgia and Lisa particularly are all so really also are always wanting to grow and kind of look for the new stuff and understand the techniques and the technicals of knitting and stuff and playing and pushing that boundary a little bit as well. And kind of, so that's, you you get to know which designers are which. So I, I never feel that we hold them back in any way because I genuinely don't think we do because we give them such a spectrum to work within. Um, I And I do feel that we push them or give them space to uh, be creative as well. Lisa, what's your take on that? Well, um, yeah, on the designer's perspective, um, I think if you were just like asked to do a design for Rowan and then of like autumn, winter, and you look through the shade card of all the different kind of like yarns, it's just too much. So to be kind of like... Um, I don't know, just kind of like narrowed down slightly to this is the yarn 
and it's an autumnal colour palette or winters with brights colour palette or something like that, um, then that kind of focuses you a little bit. And we're not prescriptive in the way that, like, um, you know, we were only taking kind of yoked sweaters for this book or something like that. Or we might be in the future, you know, there might be a book like that, but it's not like that. It's kind of more um, because, you know, like seamless story. You know, you can create something that's cuff to cuff. Um, you can create something that's worked upwards. You know, like you can do something that's like more um, adding on different parts of knitting. So you create a square and then you knit outwards from it and things. So it maybe makes your mind work in different ways rather than just thinking, just in, in your no, normal path. So yeah, it, it is different. It's kind of, it's not just do anything, but I don't think there's that many um, places where you'd be able to design and just kind of have, you know, like a big open book of just do, do anything. <laughs> when I talked to Georgia, she mentioned that she's inspired by architectures, by shadows, by play of the depth in the buildings. And that's her inspiration. And Martin is notorious for collecting all the like clippings from magazines and like fabric pictures from his travels. And Cave is all about colors. What's your inspirations? What you inspired by Lisa? Um, a bit of everything, really. I think because um, I work on the design briefs as well, then I have to kind of be more open than that sometimes and kind of sometimes think outside my comfort box to make sure that we're kind of doing something different all the time. Um, and I work in different ways. So I, if I work on a design brief, um, then I might just kind of have like a random idea while I'm out and about, normally in nature, and then start kind of picking on things like that. So maybe it'd be like, you know, you're in autumnal colours and then I look at trees and I like the shapes of the trees and kind of like the the texture of them and then start focusing more on texture of the nature around me, trees, leaves, all that kind of thing. Or it can be the actual yarn itself that's the inspiration. So sometimes if we have a brand new yarn, um, I don't start with a design brief, I just start by playing with the yarn. So all I will do is just knit swatches to see what it can do, you know, like to see whether it works well in cable, whether it works well in lace and things, um, and then work a design brief from that once I've actually figured out how the yarn works and what I like doing with it, how it plays well together. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of come at it in all different directions. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the selection process because that must be the most difficult Part. like to give the brief it's one thing and then all these designers come up with beautiful designs I'm sure and they all your friends because yeah. you're a tight team how difficult it is to actually pick the designs that are going to go into the magazine yeah so hard <laughs> <laughs> so hard is what's the hardest part is sometimes you've got to um, not choose one that you absolutely love just because it either doesn't fit with kind of the rest of the the pieces that you've got there or you've got um maybe two or three of the same kind of stitch types you you basically have to just choose one or two of them um but it is so hard I mean like David when it comes to main mag selection we've got like just every designer sends in so many and you lay them all out and you sometimes have to do it in sections we lay them all on the floor we lay them everywhere and try and kind of select down and then maybe have to do that a couple of times before we're happy with it. Yeah, really tricky. It's, it's we just like the main mag can be the main story, like 30 to 40 pieces, something like that. And we can literally have three times that amount submitted. It's just crazy. So it, you kind of almost have to remove yourself and names and personalities from the process because actually that's the way to get it down and get work through it as a team. And um, we've got pretty good at it because we kind of all we know it, there's an in that environment, it's a no holes barred. You have to say what you think. And if you don't, if you don't take the opportunity to say it, then you've missed it. But it's so it's quite an open and honest feedback from um, quite a few people in the process. So, yeah. Well, you have core designers and then you have designers who you invite as guest mm. designers for the lack of better term. Um does that mean that, like, if you are a core designer, do you have an advantage? Does it mean that your design is almost guaranteed to be in the magazine? Not necessarily, no. 
yeah it's kind of not quite that simple no, <laughs> no and um the people who we normally ask to design have still designed with us you know, like for a lot of years as well most people um so we i mean we still have strong relationships with all of these people so it's it's not like you know they're not sitting next to me in the office but you know we still kind of we know them and we know how much work they put into the design process so it's still it's not easy to say no to anything really <laughs> well the designs that don't make it into the magazine do you put them aside for other publications perhaps because like sometimes you can it might not fit into the theme of the magazine but it would be perfect on its own or like as another collection do you consider that yeah we we tend to um select over um and then what we do is we after we've done the photography or even when the garments come in we might kind of take some of them out that maybe um we think would look really good you know like as a a standalone piece or like maybe a small collection or for external press, things like that. So we do tend to kind of select extra. And then there's always times where um, there's pieces that come and it doesn't quite fit. And then we ask if we can kind of keep them to one side, maybe for another story that we know is coming up. Hmm. So, I mean, the, the over-selecting thing is, a good, is actually a good practice to have because with the best will in the world, we have sometimes have stuff that just doesn't work in it, or it comes in and it works too late, or it gets lost in the post sometimes. So we always have to have something in our back pocket that we can um, sh uh, shuffle around a little bit. Yeah. In the production of that magazine, what's the most stressful times? <laughs> Now that's really hard to say one, I have to say. <laughs> it depends who you ask in the team as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. We all have different stress points. <laughs> it's probably making sure that we have everything in to go to the photo shoot because we work with on quite tight timelines and photo shoots um, are one of our hard and fast deadlines. Like if we don't hit that, it can really have a knock on effect. And obviously we have to set a line. We have to book locations, models, hair and makeup, you know, Lisa to go out and do the styling or whoever's doing it or, you know, so it, it is a point that we have to do it. So getting everything back there. But then also we have lots of deadlines that follow that. So launches and launches to our internal market. So we're always working towards a deadline. So that's my stress. <laughs> to shoot, print deadlines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like every time I talk to you guys, like I discovered more roles that you play, like each individual person on that team. It's not just designing. It's not yeah. just photo shoots. It's like suddenly I'm figuring out that Lisa is styling the models. <laughs> like, is, is it ever too much? Like, is, is there too many expectations on each individual team member? No, I think... Um... I think that's why I've been here for 20 years is because I've got so many different like hats that I wear. So um, I like to have variety. I like to have variety with the yarns that I use. I like to have variety in what I do each day. And so going on a photo shoot or going styling or, um, you know, working out the design briefs or, you know, like knitting up swatches, it's all different. It's different all the time. It might be like a week of designing for a brochure and then doing something else but it's constantly changing um, and that's why it's that's why it's fun it's kind of, yeah yeah that's totally the same for me it's the variety that comes in so like even just today I've been working on figures and budgets and then talking to a consumer about yarn and then talking to another designer about design brief um yeah so it's totally varied you just don't know what's going to come at you in a day and that's um one of the great things about it <laughs> keeps us on our toes it does absolutely i know you can't tell me because it's everything is top secret about things yeah. that I'm but the number 74 is you have to make it always different so if you can't talk about number 75 can you talk about like the difference between 73 and 74? Like, how do you reinvent yourself all the time? How do you make this magazine something unexpected and new and fresh? How do you keep doing that? Ooh, I don't know. Um, it, it kind of 
almost just happens. And that is, I think that's part of because of the way we work, because we pull in ideas from lots of different people and lots of different design briefs. So that's what keeps it fresh. It's not always the same person leading that design brief or, um, or even how we work at it. And even just your questions to me, Lisa, today is we've said, or we can just tell that there's multiple ways we work and that brings us to the end. And it's kind of, it's that that keeps it fresh. And I think it, because you don't have a set process, I do think we get all this freshness coming in and literally we are not afraid to change it halfway through. We need, you know, we'll, we'll change it. We'll swap stuff out. We'll move stories around. Um, and that's kind of what makes it fresh. And also just making sure that we are, have an eye on what's happening in the trend world and the fashion as well. That's pretty much it, I think. Yeah, the fact that we've got um, different designers who put the different briefs in. So we're all using the same yarns. Obviously, it's all their own yarns, but we've all got different ideas of how they can be used and different inspiration that we, we kind of bring to it. So it's bound to always look different. Mm. If I design brief and then offer that to all the designers or if Martin does, it'll get something back from all those external designers. How much are you influenced by Rowan fans? Do you get the feedback? Do you get like critique of the magazine? Do people complain about something and you think, well, we should work on that. We should use more of this kind of techniques and we should represent more of that kind of fashion. Like how much influence do fans have on Rowan? Um, I think it's, we've always been influenced by, you know, like, or, um, try to adapt to what the customer kind of needs and what they want, whether that's in the way the patterns are written or whether that's the design or the yarn or anything. But I think now, um, I mean, I've been here for such a long time, so there was not really the social media kind of um, feedback before, but now there is, you get the instant feedback. Um, and you probably get it from more people as well because it's mm. so easy to kind of get in touch with Rowan. It's, you can kind of, you can put things on positive or negative and we see it um, and we've changed so much since I've been there you know like we've changed um how patterns are written um in terms of some of the tech technical side of it sizes that we have included in the designs um the fact that we're trying you know like as best we can to include more top down and in the round because we've had the feedback that that's what's kind of wanted by some people um so a lot of different things we do kind of accept it and take it on board and it might not be instantly seen that we're taking it on board and doing something about it but that's because the process is so long so if we start yeah. doing something you're not going to see that for kind of yeah. 18 months exactly and we totally it's not when we make a change we don't sticky plaster it so like we did we did uh, we were a rowing campaign which is where we jumped up to nine sizes isn't it Lisa? yeah yeah well Behind that, Lisa went off and we did a whole research into sizing and how that works and the best way to split our sizing and not just for women's sizing, split our sizing in the men's, split our sizing in the kids and kind of did a whole ground up thing. And I think that's kind of also a bit of what Rowan does. We don't, we, if we're going to change it, we're going to do it properly. And that's what we do. And that's why it takes a little bit longer. But yeah. feedback is fundamental to the brand. Absolutely. Is it hard to hear critique of the company? Because this is your baby. Like you work on it for 18 months and then it goes into the world and suddenly you get people criticizing this and that mm -hmm. and saying that they don't like something. Is it hard to hear that? It, it is hard sometimes and sometimes it's not. I think where it's hard is it people are, can have their opinion absolutely and make a comment and not like a design or not like what we do, or don't like a colour, that's absolutely fine, because that is people's opinion. And um, it's when it becomes a little bit more personal, and actually, they have to remember that we're people behind the brand, and we're people behind the designs. Um, and that's kind of where it becomes, it gets a little bit hard to take. But as I said, the feedback, all feedback's welcome. Uh, anything that's, pop, you know, helps us move forward is, is great. I also hope that this series sort of bring that up, because you know, like I, as I mentioned to you, when people think of Rowan, just because you can find this yarn practically in every corner of the world, people think it's something, this big faceless monstrosity with thousands of people working. They don't realize how small the team is and how much effort goes into like each and every issue of the magazine. 
So I mm. hope that this series will spill some light on that, you know, and show people who actually is behind those uh, mm. stories. But the other thing you've got to remember is we're talking about feedback being negative. Feedback is very positive. Right. I mean, it's just, I know that Lisa gets a buzz if she walks down the streets and sees somebody in her sweater or posts, somebody else has done it in another colorway and posts that on social media. That is all positive, all great. We just love that interaction. So it's feedback is not necessarily negative. It can be hugely positive as well. Lisa, do you remember your first celebrity moment when somebody jumped you on the street or wore your sweater or was, was like, oh, my God, it's you? Um, no, but I, I mean, like, I don't get out much. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't get I don't get that as much. I don't know whether, um, yeah, I don't get seen kind of as much. My face isn't out there so to get noticed maybe as, as often. Mm -hmm. I know that, like, I can be somewhere and be with Martin Starry and it's like, you know, it's amazing to see. He kind of, like, gets, like, a flock of um, knitters who, who come and kind of surround him and it's, it is an amazing thing but I can manage to, mm -hmm. manage to blend. <laughs> it's amazing and weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, David, you mentioned that like every time you go to stores, you ch take pictures of garments and you're just like constantly thinking of new ideas and what else can be introduced. Mm -hmm. Lisa, how does that work for you? Like, do you do the same thing? Do you constantly think of Rowan and the next magazine and the next design? Is Rowan really a lifestyle? <laughs> I think it's our lifestyle, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it's hard not to... Um, to think about it all the time because you you're constantly thinking of the next thing that you're going to be doing when you're working so far ahead um so so a lot of the time yeah you do get ideas like um for inspiration for story like design briefs or stitches and things um but yeah it, i think that's just natural for for when you do kind of the roles that we do and you it's not a bad thing. It's just it's just what happens. I think if I was, yeah, yeah, life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, if I was trying to make it happen out of you know like work time, then it, it would probably be too much. But the fact that it just it's just a natural thing that you know, like as designers, you you see things, you kind of you can't help it. So it's not a mm. it's not a bad thing. I was saying, Lisa, I said the feet, like my picture feed on my phone. If anybody else looked at that, they'd find it really weird because there's totally random pictures of like balls of wool and the, yeah. the back of a lady's sweater or you know it's yeah. like just click <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> okay you said that it takes 18 months from the start to the publishing of the magazine can you tell me a little bit about the timeline how does that like how do you split this 18 months so we've got um sometimes you'll think about colors so today we've been thinking about some new shades so that might be added into the start of it. So you need the, yeah, <laughs> you need new shades for um, whichever kind of stories you're doing to make sure that you can knit with them. So we've got to think about that right at the very beginning. So as soon as we start thinking about design briefs, we're thinking about either a new yarn or new colours in an existing quality um, to make sure that they kind of like hit at the same time. Um, so you'd have design brief where we'd then show the design briefs um, to our team, David and Sharon and some of the core designers So we pick what might be worked for that season. Um, then we will go and brief the designers. So um, send those out and give them a few weeks to be able to get the yarn from us and to be able to do the knitting of the swatches and the sketches. Um, they then come into Rowan for another meeting and we will um, select from those. Um, so when a designer sends something in, it'll be like something like that. So just a swatch, a little sketch. Um, so we'll get all of those, select down, and then we'll then go back to them and say which ones have been selected and could you send us a specification of how you want that pattern written. Uh, and it'll just be um, the sizes you know, like for that what for the one um, garment size, so just for say size 34 or something like that, and then we grade it from that. Um then they will go and get written. So yeah. and the writer will grade everything, all the sizes. Um then we'll send it out to get knitted. It'll come back, go to photography, 
come back, go to the pattern <laughs> checker, come back, go to another pattern checker. Um, yeah. In the meantime, we've got the photos back from the photography, um, and then that moves on to um, the graphics team, who will then get anything kind of um, checked with the photography. Um, and onto YouTube, but <laughs> yeah, and into the marketing kind of aspect of it. So actually, that is where we are right now. We have literally just finished all our photography for spring summer 2024. I had to think what year I was talking about there because we're always all across years. Um, and that and we are pulling together the initial marketing stuff so we can share that with our internal markets um, very soon. Um, and then it all starts to work through from that. So there's lots of presentations kind of and then planning about our marketing campaigns out to you guys. So we have list just launched autumn winter, as you said, that marketing campaign has been planned for the past ooh, five, six months. And now it's activating because we've got the photography and we've got the images and all the graphics works pulled together. And there's so, all the knitting of the um, garments for um, stores as well that yeah. has to go on in that time as well. Exactly. And, and then so you've got to get already, it out to store so people can buy it as well. <laughs> and you're already working on the fall of 2024, right? Yeah. yeah. At any one time, we can have three, sometimes four seasons working through the uh, department, uh, the design room at any one time. So at the moment, we have spring, summer, which is literally was active in the market. We've just launched autumn, winter. So that's out to the world. We're talking about that. We have done photography and we're going to marketing with spring, summer 2024. We are des design briefing, um, talking to designers, creating what autumn, winter 2024 is going to look like at the moment as well. Is that, does that get confusing? <laughs> like when a person yeah. walks into your office and tells you like, oh, like I want to talk to you. Do, you. do you like stop them and say, which year are we talking about? Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of a rule that if you start a conversation, you have to start with which season you're talking about. Um, and that's kind of how it starts. Yeah. So, but a lot of the stuff we kind of know in the design team as well. So like if we have a collection or a designer's called a particular name, if I go in and say to Lisa, talking about this collection or this design, we, we know where that is and what season that sits in. But you do have to take a minute to just kind of go, yeah, okay, right. I know where I am a <laughs> lot now, so yeah. Lisa, I want to ask you a question I've been asking everybody from Rowan. If you were on deserted island and you could only have one kind of Rowan yarn with you, which one would you pick? <laughs> Just this, on a um, deserted island, do I need it to actually make like... Um... Like yeah. fishing rod with and things like that or is it just like my favorite yarn because favorite i'd have completely yarn. different ones yeah um, if it was my favorite yarn it'd be felted tweed yeah david you're not in the majority here right no but i'm still there slugging away for my soft jack and everybody knows i love it so that's it soft jack is nice. yeah. yeah i just it's it's a vet for me it's a yarn that just works for me because i'm not the neatest or the best knitter and it just makes my knitting look lovely. And that will always make me love it. So, <laughs> Well, one of the questions I always sort of have on the back of my mind is, is it fiber art or is it craft? Like, what is it for you? What's knitting for you? Oh, I think it can <laughs> depend. I think it can really depend on... Um, on the type of thing that you're doing because sometimes it's it's totally fiber art you know like when you're doing some kind of like crazy fair aisle with embroidery and everything else you're like you but sometimes you, you you're crafting sometimes you you're knitting like a stocking stitch swatch and you can kind of watch tv at the same time i don't feel like i'm creating fiber art when i'm doing that i feel like i'm i'm just yeah i'm crafting Hundred mm. percent the same. I think I'm probably more a crafter than Lisa is a designer and a fiber artist. I mean, I like the fiber technical side of it, but then when I'm knitting, it's more the craft for me. I'm just kind of in it and it zoned, and you know, um, rather than being creative at that point. Exactly. Well, I'll ask you another difficult question. Um, I promise I'll, it, it's not going to be all <laughs> difficult. But like, as we mentioned before, 
Rowan has something for everybody and something that people will find that it's not for them at all. Mm. When we talk about like social media and stuff, there's always this concept of target audience that you have to concentrate on your niche. You have to concentrate on your target audience. You have to do what interests them. Who is Rowan's target audience for this magazine? <laughs> Ooh, That's to you, like, David. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, I think it is to you too. I, there's a very definite target for Rowan Core, and that is what I call um, the Rowanette. They love us, and they love that core and that tradition. Rowan has a very... Um, good history of our archive of our traditional knit and we're known for color work beautifully presented behind lisa's shoulder i can say <laughs> and, and we're known for our color work and the way we work yarns and our premium quality and i think kind of we couldn't narrow it down to a specific area or, or a specific knitter i think it's more general that 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 it's that kind of person that is looking for interesting knit um, challenging knit, but also just somebody that's looking for good quality knit. So it can be fairly simple, but it's just a good quality yarn supported by a good quality pattern. So there's that too. Does that, you think I've hit it there, Lisa, or not? Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> well, do you, do you have different target audience when you design, Lisa? Um, I think it depends. It, there's sometimes when you are designing a brochure, rather than the main magazine, you um, are designing for maybe um, more of a specific audience because you might be doing a brochure that is just all about colour work or you might be doing one that's you're doing quite simple textured stitches that are quite easy and, you know, like the garment construction is quite, um, the pattern would be quite simple to follow. So then you are more concentrated. But when it's the main mag, like Mag 74 for that My Way story, you just, you create in hopefully just beautiful garments. Um, so it's a lot wider kind of spectrum of people than I think. And that's what the brochures allow us to do. They allow us to focus in for that brochure. But as Lisa said, the magazine has to cover so many more people in that spectrum. Lisa, do you have a favorite design of yours in 74? Um, I had to have a quick look through before I came on to see which ones that were in it. <laughs> Favourite is from the Fine Tweed Haze. It's the Dobby design, which is a um, like a feral yoke. Well, I know how busy you are, and I'm really grateful that you found time in your schedule to do this call and to tell me a little bit about what goes behind the scenes and how this whole process is coming together and all the team that involved in this thing. So I want to thank you both for being my guest today. I've learned so much. I hope I didn't make it too difficult on you. <laughs> no, it was thank fun you. for me. <laughs> no, not difficult at all. Thanks, Irina. It's good to be asked. Um, like I said before, it's good to be asked unusual questions. It's because it makes you think and it makes you um, think about what your answer and not always say the same thing. <laughs> yeah.